Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome. This is the first of a series of workshops organized uh, by the National Academies uh, Committee on Macroeconomics and Climate. And I'm delighted to bring this meeting to order and welcome you all. Uh, my name is Bob Kopp. I am a co-chair of the uh, roundtable uh, and one of the or members, uh, substitute member really of the organizing committee. Um, before we begin, um, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to our study director, Bridget McGovern, who will provide some background on logistical and safety items. Great, thank you so much, Bob. And on behalf of the academies, I just wanna thank you all for joining us today here and online. My name is Virginia McGovern. I'm an associate program officer with the Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climate. And as Bob said, I'm the study director for the roundtable and this workshop. So before we get into the substantive content of this meeting, I just wanna provide a few safety measures and logistics for the meeting. So for those of you that are here in person, here is a map of the NAS building. We are in the east side of the building. So the closest uh, emergency exit is just right through the back, um, through those middle doors. And you can go out into the Great Hall, take a left, and you'll find yourself outside. And then the closest bathrooms are just through here. Uh, across the hallway are the bathrooms. Um, and so just some meeting logistics for those of you that are here in person and are connecting to Zoom, we ask that you not connect to the audio on Zoom and make sure that your computers are muted. Uh, when you are talking, we ask that you turn on your cameras just so we can try to uh, break the wall between in-person and virtual participation. For our virtual participants, we just ask that you remain muted unless you are speaking. And then for all participants, we ask that you use the raise hand feature on Zoom as the great equalizer between virtual and in-person participants. And so then we can call on you and you can turn on your cameras and you can either unmute for our virtual participants or uh, use the microphones in front of you for our in-person participants. And then lastly, I just want to cover briefly um, our expectations for meeting conduct. So at the academies, we are committed to fostering a professional, respectful, and inclusive environment that is free from harassment and discrimination. Uh, on the briefing materials online, you can find the do's and don'ts of meeting conduct, as well as the academy's policy for harassment and the harassment complaint process. So if you witness or experience any behaviors that violate our code of conduct, I just ask that you notify me immediately. Or if you feel more comfortable, you can, um, you can inform Jim or Bob or one of our committee members. And with that, I will turn it back over to Bob. Thank you, Bridget. So a brief introduction uh, to the National Academies. Uh, the Academies are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization uh, created during the Lincoln administration that is the nation's preeminent source of expert, evidence-based, and objective advice on science, engineering, and health matters. The Academies provide independent, objective advice to inform policy with objective scientific findings, spark progress and innovation, and confront challenges and issues for the benefit of society. Um, the academies engage in a variety of different activities towards this end. Um, for many people, probably the consensus study reports are the most familiar of those. Academies also have workshops uh, like we're at today, roundtables, um, action collaboratives, and other uh, sorts of venues. This workshop um, is part of the roundtable on macroeconomics and climate related risks and opportunities. Uh, which was created last fall as, and is co-chaired by myself and uh, Wendy Eldeberg, who, who's over there. Roundtables are neutral venues for cross-disciplinary experts from academia, uh, private businesses, civil society organizations, government, and other stakeholder groups to discuss, um, in this case, how transition and physical risks of climate change affect the macroeconomy and its implications uh, for associated policy. And our work plan includes two workshops per year over the next two years and potentially beyond. This workshop that we're at today is the first of that series of workshops. The goal of this workshop 
is to understand and identify opportunities to better incorporate climate related risks and opportunities um, in current macroeconomic models and economic policy approaches. So it's intended to enable currently used models to improve, not just to critique those models. Then the next workshop will start to look into some of the things that are not as well captured or could not be potentially well captured in existing models, things like the dynamics of how um, the climate and economy interact. And the workshops will continue to build on one another. Um, subsequent workshops will focus on things like the longer term potential to consider different macroeconomic approaches uh, and welfare, the how we think about adaptation and mitigation policy in the context of these modeling approaches and other topics. The plenary sessions of the workshop uh, that we're at here now are, are being recorded and will be available um, online after the workshop. Information gathered at this workshop and other engagement opportunities will inform the roundtable's discussions and future activities. And with every Academy's workshop, there is a staff authored proceedings that will be available after the workshop, and that includes this as well. This is not a consensus recommendation or a consensus set of finding. It is a factual accounting of what was presented and discussed here today. And we expect that that proceedings from this workshop that were today will be re released uh, late in this year, um, but the recording of, of the, the event should be available later this week. Uh, so this is uh, the planning committee. It is co-chaired uh, by Jim Stock, who will be our first speaker starting in the event from Harvard. Uh, the Academy has appointed a five member committee to plan this workshop all of whom are part of the larger roundtable. Uh, the uh, Jim Stock, Rachel Cletus, Adele Morris, Emmy Nakamura, and um, Saul Shung, who have to, had to step down uh, when he took up a, a, a new position in the executive branch, uh, were the original workshop and represented a fantastic committee with a wide range of backgrounds and expertise. Um, when Saul had to leave, I was uh, asked to step pension. So, uh, perhaps not as, as fantastic as with those original five, but we, we do our best. Uh, during the workshop, committee members will be facilitating the program, moderating the panel sessions, and acting as rapporteurs during breakout discussions tomorrow. And I'd like to extra thank you to those four members of the committee uh, for their help in shaping the agenda. So this is uh, the statement of tasks for these two days that we're at today. Um, the complete charge uh, that the committee has been tasked with can be found uh, on the project page. And this is a really broad statement of tasks, right? Our goals are to improve understanding of the relationship between the macroeconomic and climate change and climate related income by gathering experts and practitioners to consider the state of the science, foster transdisciplinary dialogue and set the stage for the next three workshops we are, we are organizing. Importantly, um, you know, we're trying to bring together uh, a variety of perspectives uh, represented here and on the workshop more broadly. Um, so very, uh, you know, traditional macroeconomic perspectives and, and broader perspectives as well. So this is a summary of the workshop agenda. Uh, we'll begin with the opening keynote uh, from Jim Stock who is also the chair of the workshop. Um, and then we will have a series of panel presentations uh, throughout the day. Um, today, there are three sessions. Uh, the first is on the current approaches used by people who are actually making uh, uh, macroeconomic projections that, that get used in policy. Um, the second is on the sort of re front research, current research frontier of climate and macroeconomics. Um, and then the third uh, does a little bit more of a deep dive on how we think about um, the economic impacts and damages and risks of climate change. There will be breakout discussions themed around uh, the workshop sessions tomorrow afternoon, followed by a session to synthesize workshop discussions. Uh, I should say that this is the, the uh, second day um, we will also be talking about transition risk and responses. Uh, you'll notice uh, 
in the uh, agenda that we have dedicated work time after each session for gathering additional inputs from both the people in this room and uh, our virtual participants. And for both of those, that will be through um, Slido, which is an interactive online tool. Um, the purpose of this time is to gather additional input and uh, ideas and questions in a place that participants have access to regarding how to advance the incorporation of climate into macroeconomic model. Prompts will appear under ideas and Slido, which is linked throughout the agenda, um, and we will be resharing this during the um, interactive times in the workshop. And we'll reintroduce this again um, after following the first panel in session one. So with that, I would like to transition uh, into our first uh, panel, which is our opening keynote uh, by uh, the planning committee chair, Jim Stock. Uh, the goal in this uh, keynote is to provide a broad overview of macroeconomic approaches and applications that will lay a foundation uh, for the rest of the workshop. And I'd remind people in the room to make sure your laptops are disconnected from uh, Zoom audio. Uh, so with that, um, let me introduce Jim. Uh, Jim Stock is the Vice Pros Post uh, for Climate and Sustainability at Harvard University. He is the Harold Hitchens Burbank Professor of Political Economy at the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard and a member of the faculty at the Harvard Kennedy School. So Jim. Thanks, Bob. That, uh, let's see, we should have a clicker. All kinds of buttons. Sorry, I went off with this. <clears throat> okay, great. So um, I do want to say that uh, I was asked to do the keynote before I became chair of the committee. So uh, for what it's worth. <laughs> um, so uh, the, purpose of, uh, the purpose of this keynote is to uh, lay out try to lay out the four corners, set out the four corners of what we're gonna be talking about in this, in this uh, workshop, and then uh, relate that to the round table a little bit uh, and talk about climate risks uh, and how they fit into macro models. So just to summarize again, Bob put this up. This is just a brief summary of the statement of task of this workshop, which is how can differential effects of climate change uh, the effects on, on critical human systems be incorporated into macro analyses. And so that's uh, got a range of sub issues. Uh, current, currently, what are we doing? How do we get at the complexity? And what are the deep uncertainties? So we're going to be talking about all of those over the course of this conference. Uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, this morning, just to get things going. Oh, and I should mention just briefly that the, uh, the, the round table itself has a somewhat more narrowly uh, defined scope. So there'll be for the online audience or people who are not in the round table, uh, this is a slightly broader definition than the round table charge, which tends to focus on US government function. So this conversation is gonna, the, the slides are gonna be a little bit more oriented around US government functions in the macro space, uh, but then the conference itself for this workshop will encompass more than just that. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to try, uh, hopefully without stepping on any toes, to lay out what the four corners of this task uh, actually are. Um, okay, so uh, so it it seems a little bit pedantic to start with the question of why are we bothering to do this, but it is always useful to start at the beginning. So I will just spend a minute or two uh, starting at the beginning. Um, and then I'm going to talk, and then I want to step away. Now, the, the workshop and the roundtable is really framed around models, but actually I'd rec like to step away from models for the moment and actually talk about problems. So what are the problems we're trying to solve? Because, of course, models are just a tool to solve a real-world problem. Models are not an end in themselves. So I'm going to talk a little bit about problems that we need to solve as macroeconomists, especially with the U.S. government focus. Then how does, so given that problem framing, how do the climate and climate related uncertainty affect, uh, affect how we would go about solving those problems? And then that's going to lead us into thinking about some of the modeling implications. And we're gonna see a variety of different modeling implications or modeling approaches in this workshop. And there'll be allusions to or references to other approaches uh, as we go forward. 
Okay, so first of all, just some starting point, uh, why introduce climate into macro modeling? Uh, you know, I, I think, I think we all understand that climate problems are going to get increasingly more challenging. Uh, they're going to have, they already are having some economic impacts. Those economic impacts are going to increase. Uh, but there's an awful lot of dimensions to climate, uh, climate problems. So I'm going to use climate problems or climate change challenges or uh, words along that effect in a really capacious definition. And, and that, the, that here, I'm going to refer to that as physical impacts of climate change, but also the effects on human systems, including endogenous. So I'm intending by this to actually have a somewhat broader definition than the usual jargon of physical risk and transition risk, where transition risk is often framed around policy. But really, transition risk is much bigger than that. It's all of the issues that are associated with moving to or sort of yeah, moving uh, in a bumpy road towards uh, towards uh, towards a clean uh, sort of zero carbon future. Uh, all of the challenges that arise in the context of doing that, uh, the challenges for businesses, the challenges of adaptation and so forth. So all of the human system stuff is is going to be encapsulated by this by this uh, by this con by this uh, definition. So climate risk, I came up at a previous meeting that maybe the word risk needs some interpretation that physical scientists and um, economists might be using this slightly differently. I'll just tell you how I'm going to be using the word risk. Uh, I'm going to be thinking about risk as being uncertain future events that have impacts. Typically, those uncertain future events will have distributions associated with it. They, they might not, and that, that gets through a separate set of questions, but I'm not going to get into that. But those uncertain future events have uh, distributions associated with it. Those distributions are non-stationary. That is just to say they're evolving over time. They tend to have a non-zero mean. Sea level rise is going up. We don't know how much sea level rise is going up. And then there's going to be impacts of those. So the risks are the risks for example, of sea level rise, and that has sort of the usual inundation, things that are fairly easy for us to at least conceptualize. But of course, there's a distribution and there's a lot of contingencies around. We, we actually really don't know what's going to be happening to Greenland. We really don't know what's going to be you know, happening in a number of other dimensions on sea level rise. So there's a lot of uncertainty uh, around that. And then, of course, that means that there's going to be a range of different impacts and risks and monetary values. Okay, so that's just sort of a terminological digression. <clears throat> um, I, I think it's useful. It's you. I find a useful framing to think about three categories. Maybe this is a little artificial, but it helps me think about three different categories of things we might be interested in in macro as macroeconomists, and then how that how climate fits into these. And one of them is just like. Traditional stuff, macroeconomists have been doing their job for a long time, decades and decades and decades. And uh, the bread and butter of macroeconomics is understanding the effects of monetary policy, understanding the effects of fiscal policy on the overall economy, you know, making projections about GDP growth and therefore employment and therefore tax receipts, understanding budgets. So making budget projections, what does it look like over the 10-year CBO a uh, 10 year budget window uh, in terms of overall economic growth, how does macro policy, how does a fiscal policy proposal affect that? Uh, you know, what's just forget about the climate side, but just on the fiscal side, we're going to spend some money because of the Inflation Reduction Act. How much is how does that how does all of those details factor into overall GDP growth? How does it uh, affect the budget? So these are bread and butter activities that economists have been doing forever. And then the question is, how does macro fit into that? Under what circumstances is macro going to play a, an important role? Excuse me, how does climate fit into that? And under what circumstances does climate play an important role? Now, the thing is, there's many, many channels, but that doesn't mean we need to treat all channels equally. Depends on what your horizon is, depends on what your problem is. And in some cases, some of these channels are probably not that important. You know, over the 10 year budget window, <clears throat> I'm not super worried about Greenland. Uh, over longer horizons, I might get super worried about Greenland. Um, so, uh, so we have to sort of be using some judgments. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Second sort of analysis is, is actually thinking about the analysis of 
of specific climate policies. And so that's kind of of interest. I'm carving that out as a separate thing. And that's because it has a budgetary impact. If we think about the IRA, that had a budgetary impact. Uh, we don't really know what the budgetary impact is. You kind of have to estimate it. There's a bunch of different estimates floating around out there. But of course, the reason you're doing this is because you think it's going to have a climate impact too. So, uh, so you want to be able to make some joint understanding, come to a joint understanding of what both the budgetary and climate impact of the IRA is. And to the extent that it's important from a macro perspective, that's an open question. Maybe it is, maybe it's not big enough to be important from a macro perspective, but to the extent that it is, one needs to analyze the macro feedbacks of this legislation. Uh, uh, you, in theory, maybe the IRA is gonna reduce emissions and then that's going to reduce the rise of temperatures. And then that's gonna have some feedback over to the macro economy but you know, over the ten-year budget window, that's got to be um, that's got to be negligible. You're doing this for sort of longer-term impacts and so forth. Um, okay, uh, and then and then there's a third category, which uh, is really think about really long-term uh, calculations. So, what's the social cost of carbon? It's so probably you're all familiar. Many people here are familiar with estimates, how you estimate the social cost of carbon using integrated assessment models. And those are literally looking out uh, centuries in, a, in the future. And then what are the impacts of, uh, say, a current path or a particular path of emissions and growth and so forth? And then what are the damages associated with that in the very long run? That's where Greenland becomes like really important. Um, and so uh, so that's a, that's a separate set of questions. I'm carving that out. And you could also think about what's like, what's the optimal carbon tax to achieve a two degree threshold or something at a global level? Because of course the two degrees is a global problem. So I'm carving that out separately because I think we're, uh, the, that's really not, that final category is not so much a focus of the round table. It's gonna come up in passing in some of the conversations in this conference, but, um, but that's, uh, but, there, uh, but that, uh, and one reason I mentioned make that comment is there was an NAS study back in 2017 that um, that uh, uh, looked at uh, the social cost of carbon and IMs and made a number of recommendations. And uh, so this is uh, this is um, you know we're looking for uh, additionality here. Okay. So here's a little uh, diagram of a bunch of these different problems that macroeconomists face. Now, this is very oriented towards federal agencies, but I think one can also think about this in the context of how macroeconomists in academics or in think tanks or, you know, at the, at, uh, in, other, in other countries also might parse these issues. So the, the, uh, the x-axis is, is time. Uh, and the y-axis is not really an axis, but just a list of different federal agencies. Uh, so, um, for those of you who are not from Washington, you might need the key on the lower right-hand corner. Uh, but, uh, uh, but I bet that the many people in this room know what every single one of those acronyms actually stands for. Um, but you can see sort of, you know, I mentioned monetary, assessing monetary policy, guiding monetary policy. So that is a, an enormous field with a great deal of interest and great deal of importance and terribly important. Uh, 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 there's um, there's a, a related to monetary policy right above that is um, what's a, a financial uh, system oversight council. Uh, so that's FSOC uh, council or committee financial system oversight council. Okay, yeah, so I got it right here. Uh, and that's, uh, that's charged with um, understanding systemic risks to the financial system. Uh, and that that you know works on multiple horizons. Uh, there's plain old economic forecasting. CEA does a lot of just economic forecasting. Either <clears throat> how is the economy going to look like based on you know our best guess of conditions, or there might be some conditional forecasting um, where you might say, suppose we implement this policy, what do you think that would actually do? Um, there's this 10-year budget window that I mentioned, where CBO, uh, the Joint um, Committee on Taxation. Uh, do it on the congressional side, OMB, the, the Troika, OMB, CEA, and U.S. Treasury, do it on the uh, executive side. Our next session, right after my talk, is going to be representatives from that crew using a couple of different models uh, and then talking about climate in those models. 
getting out there more distantly, you know, if you listen to the news a little bit, if you ever, if you pay attention to the social security part, which is easy to tune out, but if you pay attention to the social security part, people are starting to get a little bit worried that the trust fund might be running out of money. Well, that works on a 75 year horizon, those budget calculations. And then there's this part that I think that um, I'm not gonna, it's shaded in gray, cause I'm not gonna really focus on that, which is the deep horizon, the distant horizon, social cost of carbon type calculations. If you think about what fits into these from an economic perspective, and the reason I'm gonna go through this briefly is that from an economic perspective, uh, from an economic perspective, it's useful to know what are the key inputs because that tells you how we can think about how climate might affect the key inputs for these models. So certainly determinants of long run growth really matter at these longer term horizons. So that's growth rates of total factor productivity, labor productivity, capital stock, labor force, so our stars, the long-term or natural rate of interest, and uh, that, of course, affects uh, uh, capital stock and so forth. Uh, so, so those are th things that would affect, would be inputs to those models. Um, there's uh, current economic conditions. So once, if you're just paying attention to a really long time frame, then current economic conditions kind of wash out. But, uh, but current economic conditions most certainly matter for shorter term forecasting, for monetary policy. That's all about starting with current economic conditions and worrying about what's happening over the next quarters or years. So that has to do with overall economic activity, GDP growth, employment, and, and all of the other factors that we know affect uh, macroeconomics. So there's no climate. I haven't gotten any climate in here, no climate at all yet. Um, what are the outcomes here? In all cases, some of the, uh, all of these produce outcomes that are related to future economic activity. In some cases, that's the main thing to come out. Uh, in other cases, it's a piece of what comes out. So, uh, so, uh, so that's, uh, that's, certainly, that's certainly part of it. And that's a future economic activity. When I say that, that sort of is a buzzword or a catch-all for like all of the current stuff that describes the state of economy. So whether that's employment, uh, employment growth, GDP growth, uh, inflation, uh, sectoral inflation, interest rates, uh, those the sorts of things that we would be uh, normally interested in, in terms of understanding economic state, state of the economy. Okay, and I will just put down GDP. Uh, it's useful to remember this uh, because GDP is the market value of domestically produced final goods and services. That's what it is. That's a measure of overall, a, a, you know, the common measure of overall economic activity. Uh, that is sort of a key output and a key driver. GDP and incomes is what drives tax receipts. So a number of uh, these other issues, GDP income, and well, also like state of the stock market and so forth uh, is what drives tax receipts. Um, so there's going to be budget specific information that comes out of these different models, tax receipts, expenditures, um, and then various economic statistics. So apparently, my friend uh, Steve Braun, who's sitting here in the back, tells me that we have to, the Troika has to forecast 41 different variables or 40 something ish different variables for input into uh, the, the actual budget calculations because they're all sort of indexed in different ways. Is that like vaguely accurate, Steve? Just yes or no is good enough. <laughs> A little, a little less than 41, but but lot, many, many. Okay. All right. Um, and, and I will, I'm going to make a note that this focus on GDP, real economic activity, sort of the bread and butter for macroeconomists do, it's really, it's, a, it, I think the reason I wrote down the GDP definition, it's the market value of domestically produced final goods and services. So GDP does not incorporate a whole ton of things that we actually care about. So we actually care about climate driven mortality. So when a, you know a number of people die from a heat, from heat stress, that that like is that has negative welfare consequences. We're not pleased with that outcome. The GDP consequences depends on the age of the individuals, whether they're working. The GDP consequences might be you know certainly quite different than just the value of those those lives in that particular you know the value of those lives. So I think you know it's important to keep in mind that 
that that we actually care about many things that are not actually either measured by GDP, so they might have some market values but aren't measured by GDP, or simply don't even have market values. And those are all things that are you know incorporated into welfare. And if we think about the future value, what is the social cost of carbon? That definition isn't is the monetized future damages from one more ton of carbon emissions. But those damages, that word damages is different than the word GDP impacts. So those damages are going to include things like mortality and uh, species loss. Uh, species loss is a little tiny bit of that is monetized and market, market value, but most of species loss is non-market value, but that doesn't mean it has no value. It just means it doesn't have a market value. So sort of incorporating all of those things is terribly important, but not so much if you're just the CBO trying to do a 10 year budget calculation okay because a 10 year budget calculation is about tax receipts and it's about you know expenditures and inflation and that sort of stuff okay so i'm not dismissing it but i'm just saying that for much of these tasks it's not really central okay um there are a whole ton of so now there's this question of like how do we parse these different risks so uh so i, I had said I had said that, I, that my definition is capacious of, of climate related risks. And so this is only a subset of what might be there. Uh, and these different risks occur at different horizons. And then I've sort of very arbitrarily uh, had them have different magnitudes. So up in the upper right-hand corner, abrupt irreversible events could potentially be extremely damaging. Greenland losing how many meters worth of, you know, many meters worth of ice, uh, that many meters worth of sea level rise because of Greenland or West Antarctic ice sheet, uh, you know, incredibly damaging, uh, huge ramifications for human and natural systems. That's not going to happen for a long time. So that's up there in the upper right hand corner, um, at least a long time if our framework is monetary policy, CBO. Um, on the other end of things, stuff is happening already. Uh, you know, we've had substantial asset revaluations. Coal companies in the United States have very low valuations. That part of the energy transition has already been incorporated into asset markets. Many other aspects, you know, of petroleum companies have reduced market valuations too, although they went up uh, because of the Ukraine, uh, because of the war in Ukraine. But, uh, but a lot of those have actually already happened and you know they've happened and like there's been really pretty limited macro consequences. So that's over there in the far left corner. And that's, you know, this is expressing some far left lower corner. And this is expressing some opinions on my sort of informed opinions and people might disagree on some of these. Uh, but I, you know, there's other ones that are potentially really substantial, but we don't know very much about at all, like geopolitical strife. And that could be going on during a long period of time during the energy transition. So thinking about how to incorporate those risks, where do they fit into macro is uh, some of these are going to be relatively, you know, more straightforward than others. So if we think about droughts and agricultural productivity, you can kind of figure out how to, how to, connect the dots, if we think about geopolitical strife and how did we fit that into models, that's like getting way harder. Um, so I have a little diagram here of uh, physical risk and transition risks. So in the long run, what's going to matter, things like um, natural, you know, the, the steady state rate of inflation, uh, the steady state real rate of, uh, of interest, uh, steady state rate of unemployment, or alternatively, we could think about labor force participation rate or labor force, the magnitude, labor, the growth rate of the labor force, growth rate of productivity, things along those lines. And then those are going to be for sure affected by a wide range of different, a wide range of different variables. Uh, sea level rise, adaptation costs. I've just mentioned a very few of them here. Productivity uh, that'd be associated with um, substantial climatic changes over the over the uh, uh, longer run. Um, and then there's physical risks that might be happening in the short run, and we can think about what those are. Uh, you know, arguably many of those are not ones that really rise to a. They they are important for the people involved, but perhaps at least not yet have not risen to a macro uh, level of uh, of impact of the physical risks. You know, arguably in the shorter run, especially a lot of the risks uh, into the, the macro risks are associated with energy transition risks or human system risks. And I've just listed a few of those down there in the lower right corner: energy price shocks. Uh, maybe asset price shocks, um, uh, if if they're sort of sufficiently correlated, uh, 
um, policy transition shocks. So, you know, vicissitudes of policy. I mean, it's just all you have to do is look at um, the pushback in uh, Germany against uh, like natural gas, excuse me, against, you know, not having a, allowing gas hookups and, and gas cooking and so forth. And the pushback in France against, uh, you know, aggressive energy policies and seeing that here, you know, you know, there's a lot of risks of uh, various political economy issues uh, in the future. Uh, and then, and then I mentioned unknown unknowns, which is something we always have to keep in mind. Okay, so uh, briefly, what are the you know we have different models at these different horizons. This is really an important point. So um, for all of the macroeconomists, know this that we have different models. Each model has a different purpose, and each purpose has a, basically has a different model. There's no such thing as the model of the economy. That's like not how it works. So it's not like we've got like one big GCM and we just like run it on a supercomputer. Uh, and, and so, you know, you make certain assumptions and simplification so that you can solve problems in uh, solve and solve specific different problems. So in the very long term, a lot of those growth issues, you know, boil down to uh, one way to think about it is this growth identity. So this is growth rate of GDP is growth rate of GDP per uh, hour. Uh, growth rate of hours per employment. So that's like hourly, how much you work, uh, how many uh, hours you work, uh, growth rate of employment over the labor force. So that's like the unemployment rate, grossly the labor force over the population, labor force participation rate, and the growth rate in the population. Over most business, over long terms, you sort of think that hours per worker might not change much, although chat GPT might change that. Uh, uh, employment as a fraction of the labor force, you sort of tend to think that's, you know, you're going to be at some some sort of steady state unemployment rate. So a lot, you know, really what's loading up here is labor force participation rate and productivity growth rates. And then how do those things get affected? So the question is how might those things be affected by uh, underlying forces and in particular climate. In the middle here, I have a graph, just a chart from the CBO uh, economic budget and economic outlook in February, which is their plot of what the, uh, what the federal debt held by the public looks like. You can see the uh, the current is the is the that little vertical line, and then they've got a projection, um, which sort of grabs your attention, uh, and um, and then that you know that a lot part of that is these long term growth things, but a lot of that is the different uh, budget assumptions that are going into it. Um, and then on the short run, there's a lot of there are many many different tools that are available. They tend to manifest as impulse. They often manifest as impulse response functions with respect to shocks. This is an impulse response function with respect to uh, an oil supply shock from a fairly recent paper uh, in the AER. But there's a you know multiple of different uh, approaches to that. Uh, approaches to that. Some looking at structural issues. Some looking at more uh, sort of semi se uh, semi structural or empirical approaches. Okay, so uh, I think I pretty much just said this. There's different models and di different approaches and different uh, different uh, different uh, approaches here, uh, and different models for these different uh, different sets. Um, so then the question is, you know, how does how does climate fit into this? And so I think that's really a big question for this talk. I think if you were expecting in the keynote that I would have the answer, I don't have the answer. I think that's the purpose of this workshop. But I think I would want to stress a few different, I want to stress a few different high level points. So one of them is that there's different models for different tasks. So there, you know, so that's really important to keep in mind. Um, and then, and then, you know, climate enters a variety of different ways. It can certainly enter through the growth baseline. So if you're CBO, and or OMB, and you want to make a projection of uh, a projection of tax receipts. That tax that projection is going to have a productivity growth rate. It's going to have a growth rate of the capital stock. Uh, and and if we have big, if we have either negative climate effects, for example, reduced productivity because of heat, just as an example, or we have big policy effects. For example, the IRA stimulates a lot of investment and sort of more capital stock. Those things are going to be entering, you know, the current policy baseline. And so that current policy baseline might wiggle a little bit, but a little bit of wiggle in that current policy baseline is worth like many, many, many billions of dollars in tax receipts. So it's kind of worth getting that wiggle uh, right. Actually, it's worth really paying attention to that at the 10 year horizon. It's also going to address the distribution of future shocks. So I think one thing that 
you know, economists, academic economists tend to complain about is that a lot of these projections not, I mean, driven, uh, a, a lot of the projections that one sees, for example, this one here uh, for some CBO uh, doesn't have any uncertainty bands or associated with it. So we know there's just tremendous uncertainty associated with that. And I don't want to criticize CBO or RMB. They are well aware of this, but still in the public communication sphere, it tends to be common that a single projection is made to the extent that climate, and I think it does, increases those uncertainty bands. I think there's at least a scientific merit for trying to elaborate that and elucidate, elucidate all of that. And then, of course, there's the aspect of human reactions to these climate risks, and sort of that's an endogenous process. Um, I will stress that for macro purposes, the bottom line really is real economic activity for many of these calculations. You know, GDP drives and, and its related variables drives receipts and so forth. Um, and then uh, and then this is just an assertion on my part or an opinion. I'll rate this as an opinion that the transition risk, especially over the next over, say, a decade horizon, is substantially more important than actually the physical risks, that it's really all about the, the, climate, tra the climate transition, where that's human system broadly defined. So that um, I'm probably two minutes over. OK. Thank you, Jim. Um, so we're now going to transition for the rest of the hour into uh, Q&A. Um, because the Academy is striving to make an equal playing field between the people in the room and the, and the people online, we ask uh, the people in the room as well as the people online to use the raise hand function in Zoom uh, to ask questions. Uh, I would say for the, if somebody in the room doesn't have a computer and you want to jump up and wave your hand, uh, I'll try to pay attention to that too. Um, so uh, I'll give folks a, a second to get organized. Um, I would so one one thought, Jim, on on what you were saying. If economists uh, don't just have one GCM for supercomputers, of course, climate scientists don't just have one GCM and run a supercomputer sizer. We, we as climate scientists, we think a lot about what the right model is for the task too, and have a variety of different ranges of complexity. So there's actually a lot of analogies there. Um, so we have a question uh, from Dubay um, at, at Los Alamos. Uh, you want to go ahead yeah, and ask a question? Yeah, thank you for setting the stage pretty nicely. I have a, you did clarify the time scales. Uh, there is empirical information on the increase, natural events like storms and floods, their damage and costs associated with that. Uh, however, it's confounded by what is natural variability and what is the effect of climate. So that aspect should be, I would say that's that would be a focus, is what are the metrics, the empirical effects? You showed the human system, the economic system. Uh, and so I just want to raise that issue that there is data that already people are talking about billions. It, it's affecting the insurance history. It's in, affecting you know California where it's, if people refuse to uh, insure. So that's part of our economic system. I presume it's measured in GDP, but I'm not an economist. But you see, there's already issues going on. And a key issue will be action will be short term, right? Decadal. Uh, whereas, you know, and decadal will integrate to centennial scale. So I just want to throw that out that there are these measures that have answered these, but, you know, the Climate is contributing. So how do you metric that and feed that into the economic model uh, would be important. Yeah, thanks. That's that's great. So I'm actually really glad that you raised the um, the wildfires in California insurance situation. And, and uh, so there's, a, there's maybe a couple of questions in there. One is sort of, are you able to use data, historical data, even though there's confounders between <clears throat> natural variability and climate, are you able to use historical data uh, for making projections of damages uh, and, and losses? And the answer is, yeah, there's a thriving literature on that. We have some of the experts on that uh, here in this room. So I think we'll hear more about that in particular in a later session. Um, let me just comment. Uh, and, and then of course that can be, if you then sort of take those uh, and, and then you layer on, well, how much more worse or will those, let's, that particular uh, storms or droughts or whatever the 
uh, a variable happens to be, be in a, in a future scenario where it's warmer, you can bring the climate models into bear and then, uh, and then have those projections of these different, you know, combining the natural variability and then worsening the climate component. So I think that's a, it, for sure, that's for sure an important part of some of these calculations. I think it's, you know, what you're saying is it's really interesting on the uh, thing about the California wildfires. I mean, it's quite terrible thing about the California wildfires, but it's very interesting thinking about them in terms of how that actually feeds feeds through because it's there's the problem of the wildfires, which is quite severe, uh, and they have multiple impacts on the on everything about California on the on the state of California. Direct impacts for those who have their homes lost and. That's you know a, a you know that's a meaningful number of people, but it's not maybe at the level of macroeconomics. It has substantial impacts in terms of threats for the entire grid st stability of the grid. You know whether you're going to be able to whether it pulls threatens en critical energy systems, um, and then sort of this this very interesting feature, which is that it's currently leading to a sort of a cascading what appears to be. I will conjecture appears to be in a real time a real time market meltdown of the insurance industry, uh, and that's part you know that's a really complicated human systems problem because we have historically a number of things that restrict what insurers can actually do, and then uh, and then we have this backstop system in California and no, some number of other states have this backstop insurance system, and it kind of is a cascade down to the backstop public insurance system. And so I think we're seeing that, you know, whether you argue that that's a matter of not being able to price things properly under California regulations or whatever, but it then that, of course, if you can't get uh, you can't get the insurance, then that's going to make a huge impact in terms of what people live. Now, there is a question as to whether that's a, a big enough. Effect. It's a huge effect if you live in you know one of the impacted counties in Northern California, whether that's a big enough effect to toggle up to monetary policy or you know projections of growth and budgets for CBO, that's sort of a less obvious question, at least at that horizon. But I think that's an open, it's an open, that's an empirical question. We shouldn't prejudge the answer. And it's also an open question like these mess ups in the insurance markets, are those, those in particular aren't going to have any systemic effects, but could other similar mess ups in insurance markets have financial system systemic effects? So it's a really interesting microcosm of a question. So actually, Jim, if I could ask a follow-up question, if we just limit ourselves to the 10-year window, how do existing macro models think about existing climate and weather shocks? So I'm actually going to punt that okay. to exactly the next panel. Uh, which is um, our our colleagues from OMB, CEA, and uh, CBO talking about their models and that particular. They're going to answer that in, okay. in detail. Excellent. I hope. Um, so, uh, committee member uh, Bilal Ayub uh, from Mar University of Maryland. Um, uh, yes, thank you, Jim, so much for the, the introduction. Uh, I have a uh, uh, three-part question, uh, and it's all about the built environment, the infrastructure. Uh, according to the U.S. Bureau of Census, we put in the ground about one and a half trillion dollars worth of infrastructure every year. So if I take an average life of 50 to 100 years, we could say that uh, the built environment might be at 100 trillion dollars, which requires renewal, and always it receives a grade of uh, C or D by the American Society of Civil Engineers. Uh, so it does require renewal, and it will be stressed excessively because you know it was designed for historic hazards, and uh, and it wasn't designed for future hazards. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and this is a mixed bag because if we renew it, it will contribute to the GDP. It could be renewed through policy, uh, through building codes, which will, which will make its way in policy. Uh, and uh, at the same time, any loss will cut on the GDP and so on. Uh, the other item is attribution. How can we separate climate from other things, uh, deterior, uh, uh, other factors that are natural variability and so on? And the third part to my question is about risk attitude. Do you think that risk attitude changes where people will be investing more to deal with climate in a risk averse mindset as, as opposed to risk neutral? Will end up having some impact on on the macroeconomy. That last question is really interesting. Um, 
I don't think I have uh, any insights into sort of how variation, either how risk attitude towards risk might evolve. I mean, humans adapt, uh, or alternatively, you know, how that might result in geographic sorting or something like that. I think is an interesting. That's for sure an interesting set of questions. I think one thing I should stress is that my, you know, my lists and my pictures shouldn't be interpreted as like encyclopedic. I mean, there's, you know, uh, there's a lot more, a lot more issues as we start to think about this. Um, the attribution question, uh, I think we're going to be talking a little bit about attribution of these, you know, the climate versus weather type stuff in a later session. Uh, and I see Saul Shang sitting here in the front row. So the last thing I'm going to do is to try to answer that question when we have somebody who actually knows what they're talking about uh, on it. Um, I, I think that, that so the built environment and infrastructure risk for sure. I mean, this is really a big deal, right? I mean, some of our infrastructure is not going to be particularly impacted by climate, but some of it's going to be highly threatened and some of it needs to be revamped and it's, and we have evolving flood risks and we have evolving flood plain maps and, and all of that stuff. So this is a, a first order huge, this is a huge deal. So, um, so that's going to that's going to cost a lot of money and that's going to be adaptation costs and those adaptation costs are going to detract from gdp at a very crude level uh if you have to replace a bridge that you wouldn't have otherwise replaced if you have to elevate a road that you wouldn't have otherwise elevated then that is just like literally taking money and throwing it in the ocean it is not improving economic welfare it's not improving economic activity it's just like a straight like loss because you've had to spend the money doing something that you wouldn't have had to do had it not been for climate change so that is just a straight hit to for example the capital stock you could have taken that and and spent that on something much more productive you know absent climate change so that's just a straight hit on uh, on on uh, on GDP in terms of expenditures and on productive capital uh, in the in the future. Uh, I mean, not, not on GDP, excuse me, because the, you still have the same people building things, but on productive capital in the future, uh, because you haven't used that in a productive way. So those are, you know, those are things that need to be factored in uh, for sure. Um, um, so Saul, are, is, are you on this point? Since you got called out by name, I'll let you jump the queue if you're responding directly. Okay. Um, so then uh, Fak Fakri Hasanov. Oh, oh yeah. Thank, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, so on slide 13, you showed your growth equation and, and you called it long-term growth. So I would like to understand it correctly, which is very important for me. The problem that I have is that um, usually growth rate of the variables, they are stationary and the equations based on stationary variables are usually about short-term relationships like error or equilibrium correction models or growth equations. So how should I get it right? Thank you. Yeah, so, um, so this is a great, Sort of a more technical question, which is, I had asserted that many of these many of these distributions are non-stationary. So distribution, I gave sea level rise as an example. So there's going to be more sea level rise. We don't know what it is. So it's a distribution, and that distribution is changing over horizons. Uh, and sort of when I say non-stationary, it's our to be precise, it's our conditional distribution based on what we know today of what sea level is going to look like. Uh, in the future. So that's the distribution that's relevant, uh, you know, in for some of these calculations. Um, so that that doesn't, so then there's a question of, does that mean that we have non-stationary um, links exactly. between those conditional distributions like sea level rise and things like productivity? And I think the answer is not, not necessarily, they might be nonlinear. So as sea level rises more, it's going to infiltrate into sort of an increasing amount of land and so maybe that's going to then have have additional impact so it's not necessarily the case that like economic impacts conditional on sea level is a non-stationary relationship it might be a non-station it might be a non-stationary relationship but it's not doesn't doesn't necessarily have to be just because the you know uh uh you know gdp conditional on sea level doesn't have to be non-stationary even if sea level is not stationary but 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 that's like that would be an open question. 
can I just actually just pause on one thing on the previous question? Uh, there, it actually is worth, I, I hit, I, I made a mistake and then I corrected myself, but I want to actually spend some time on that mistake and the correction because it's an important one, which is that uh, I had said that to having to spend money elevating a roadway will have a negative GDP effect. That's actually not correct. In the year that you elevate that roadway, had there been no climate change, I could have like built a new, well, I don't know, a new transit line or done something meritorious. Instead, I'm spending it on just elevating the roadway. The workers, to a first approximation, the workers on the new transit line and the workers on the roadway are going to be paid the same amount. So it's kind of a wash in GDP. But what it does mean is that my capital stock is going to be less productive at infrastructure going forward because I never got around to building that transit line. I've just been elevating all my roadways. So that's going to affect the long-term growth rate of GDP down the road. Okay, so that's actually another you know, one of these contrasts between GDP and non-GDP issues. So uh, we have three minutes left. I'm going to ask the next um, two uh, questioners to ask their questions and then hand them both to Jim. So that would be uh, Roundtable co-chair uh, Wendy Edelberg and Roundtable member Heather Boucher. Uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, why don't I, I'm trying to keep keep to order. Well, uh, so we have four questions in together. I don't think we're going to get to all of them. All right, I'll be I'll try to be super fast. I just wanted to make sure that that uh, people understood how very challenging uh, the, the, uh, project, like it, how very challenging the task was that Jim laid out in terms of incorporating climate into these projections. <clears throat> so GDP or projections of GDP, it's calibrated to a history. So first the task is to figure out how climate has affected the economy in the past to, to get a handle on how to calibrate these, these models. But then one has to figure out, are you trying to, like CBO has one projection. It doesn't have a, I mean, it can create a series of scenarios, but it really has one projection. Um, CEA and OMB create one projection. The Social Security Administration creates one projection. So what that is meant to be, what if, if we want to say that climate is explicitly incorporated into those projections, we have to figure out what that what that projection of climate is and how to characterize it. And presumably then it's policymakers sitting on their hands, right? You're not trying to incorporate active fiscal policy into that projection. So figuring out what the climate is gonna do and then what adaptation is and what mitigation is, if policymakers sit on their hands, but it, presumably the private sector doesn't, like that's a, wildly difficult task. And so I just I just want to make sure that it didn't seem like, oh, well, we just need to put in like temperature increase into these models and 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 we're off to the races. All right. So unfortunately, I think we have to end there and transition to uh, the next panel, um, which will tell us more about the models actually being used uh, in policy offices. Um, and so I'm going to hand it over to Jim uh, to be the moderator for the next panel. Okay, so uh, we're going straight into the next panel. So uh, we're going to have uh, Fran Moore and John Lindner, Jan, Fran from CEA and John Lindner from OMB, and they're going to start off talking about their uh, uh, talking about their work in this area. How do we get this slide up? John, whenever you are ready. Okay, thanks so much for um, for having Fran and I here. We're um, sharing a presentation. I'll do the first 
uh, 10 or so slides and then I'll pass it to Fran. Um, so let me just start off by, um, by going over the session objectives. So um, Fran, if you could move to the next slide, the first slide. So we're really here thinking about understanding the goals of macroeconomic models and the inputs uh, that are used at decision-making levels. And so uh, we have a very specific perspective on this, right? So we're gonna be thinking about this from the perspective of OMB and CEA and the Troika um, economic assumptions, as well as uh, the long-term budget outlook that OMB produces as part of the president's budget. Um, and the reason we're thinking about this, so Jim, Jim asked, why are we introducing this? Well, there's an executive order that tells us we have to um, for, for starters, but second, as Jim has highlighted, this is really, really important, right? We know the climate risks are getting larger. They're gonna have macroeconomic impacts as well as welfare impacts. And so we should be, we should be thinking about this. So I'll talk about the first two bullets. Um, the first two bullets are thinking about inputs to macroeconomic models used to forecast GDP and other headline numbers. Uh, and then thinking about, um, you know, how are these representing real world processes? Um, so let's move to the next slide. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and skip a little bit of this just because Jim did a very good job of, of summarizing a lot of these points. But the first point um, is just what Jim uh, repeated often and, and Bob mentioned it in the climate space as well. But you know these models are designed to answer very specific questions. And, um, and so we have to think about the question we're trying to answer in this case, right? So we are very much in the space where we want to produce a macroeconomic forecast. So um, if any of you were at the Peterson event last week, um, you know, we, we can't really think about these stylized types of theoretical models. We have to be very empiric. We have to produce um, a near-term macroeconomic forecast that's focused on market outcomes. Uh, the second point here is that um, even within this world of producing near-term macroeconomic forecasts, there are a variety of ways to do this, right? So we are using um, a framework that's created by uh, now, well, now owned by S&P, but was created by macroeconomic advisors. It is a macroeconometric structural model of the U.S. economy. Uh, it's different from some of the other approaches you might see, like a vector autoregression or a dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model. Um, and so um, we are using this in the budget framework because it has some advantages for budgeting. In particular, um, this macroeconomic advisors model uh, produces projections for the national income product and accounts, which is very useful for our budgeting of uh, revenues and tax expenditures. And the third point is just that all of these models are still just tools. So there's always going to be judgment involved. Um, and so I, you know, I could always defer to Steve Braun, who uh, is in the room, but, um, and, and he'll be the first to tell you, but, you know, Mouse is, uh, is, a, is a framework. It's a, it's a way of thinking about the economy, but we have to impose our opinion about what the forecast will look like into that framework. Um, and so a lot of what we do is going to be um, imposing our view of the world, which is informed by proposed policies in the president's budget into this framework. Um, so let's go to the next slide and you can see this is directly from uh, a joint white paper that we released in March between OMB and CEA. It was produced in an interagency working group that, um, that includes a bunch of federal agencies and their expertise. Um, but this summarizes generally the framework we're working under. And the macroeconomic part you want to focus on is the two left panels. So if we start in the top left corner, you can see the framework we're working under to produce the economic assumptions in 10 years for the budget projections. Um, the first gray box on the left shows all of the external knowledge that we're going to impose into this macro advisors framework. And then we pass that off to uh, OMB and we produce a subset of variables uh, that Steve mentioned that gets used for budget projections. Within OMB then, after the 10, it's actually 11 year window, we extend that out for another 15 years. So we have a 25 year economic projection. And after 11 years, the general assumption is that we are on a balanced growth path. So 
Um, Jim also did a very good job of highlighting uh, why that could be problematic if we're trying to incorporate climate risks, which we know are, you know, non-stationary, non-symmetric, um, and, and are de definitely going to change the structure of the economy and the historical relationships we're building this, this forecast upon. Um, so let me say a little bit more about each of these boxes. So um, on the next slide, you can see we're highlighting this top left corner where we're thinking about the Troika 10 year or 11 year assumptions. And, um, and the point I just wanna drive home is that we are imposing a lot of external knowledge into this economic structure that is the macro uh, economic advisors model, right? So many of the very important variables that you would think uh, are relevant for budgeting or for uh, macroeconomic outcomes are things that we are considering outside of the mouse framework. Uh, we have a group of macroeconomic forecasters across CEA, Treasury, and OMB that are thinking hard about, you know, what should our interest rate projection be? What should our projection for oil prices be? We have a separate federal sector model because that's where OMB's expertise is. Uh, and we're thinking separately about, you know, unemployment rate, inflation, and GDP. Um, and since GDP is of particular interest, this is probably a good place to note that Jim's supply side identity that he showed previously on his slides is, uh, is generally how we think about the, the GDP path for the end of this 11 year window, right? So we are thinking about the supply side identity, adding up growth in population and labor force and productivity. Um, the second point is that, uh, and this is getting back to the idea of judgment, but all of this external knowledge, it, it fits into the macro advisors framework, but as Steve Braun will tell you, it requires a lot of uh, additional judgment and tinkering to make sure that it fits in correctly and smoothly. Um, and also that, you know, when we overwrite these variables, we're not overwriting some of the relationships that we want that connect these important variables to the the national income accounts that we need for budgeting. Uh, so the next slide just shows what the final outcome is in this process. So we produce a set of economic assumptions. It is It ends up being a quarterly projection out for 11 years, and we provide these, um, these variables to a bunch of different federal agencies so they can project spending. Um, and so basically the, the final sub-bullet is moving from the top left to the top right, from some economic assumptions to 10 year budget projections. After 11 years, um, the next part is we move down from the top left to the bottom left. And so, as I mentioned, we're, we're assuming generally we're on a balanced growth path. So most of the growth rates are held constant. Um, all of the income variables we hold constant as a share of GDP, things like interest rates and unemployment rate, we hold constant. Uh, and we typically only use this over a 25 year window. Um, and just the thing to highlight here is that this particular bottom left quadrant is where we've imposed climate the last two years. So OMB produces a long-term budget projection. Uh, we've adjusted the long-run productivity path in alternative scenarios the last two years to impose um, climate. And so Fran will talk more about how we do this, but the next slide sort of shows the, the end result. It's a series of debt to GDP path alternatives under different um, climate scenarios. Uh, and so the last point I'll make is just um, how are these models being, you know, generated to represent real world processes? Well, um, there are a couple of ways. First is that the macro advisors model imposes some structure. So, um, you know, we, we have these historical relationships about the way the world has worked and how economic outcomes are related. So this is capturing some of those, those processes. To the extent that we're overwriting some of these, um, we're overwriting them in ways that are similar to macro advisors. So we're just incorporating um, some extra considerations like updated market data, the consideration of uh, proposed policies, and, uh, and looking at external forecasters um, outside of the macro advisors forecast. Uh, the important point here, um, and this is getting to, to Bob's question at the end, is that currently within this framework, there is no explicit consideration of climate impacts uh, outside of the the alternatives in the long run. So the president's economic assumptions do not consider climate beyond beyond the point of what Wendy mentioned, which is that it's it's captured in our historical relationships. Um, so I'll I'll pass to Fran now. Thanks, John. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so um, John, John kind of outlined the framework of the um, of the macroeconomic forecast for the president's budget, and I'm going to talk, I think, delve a little bit more into uh, the climate, uh, the work we've done so far to try and integrate some aspects of climate risk into the, into the long term budget scenarios, um, as well as how we're thinking about possibly going forward um, for a kind of fuller integration. And so as John mentioned, we, we produced a white paper uh, several months ago that lays out a lot of uh, the thinking here. Um, and so a lot of what you're seeing here is kind of also captured in there. Um, in thinking in the FY24 uh, climate risk alternatives that were presented in the long-term budget outlook, we, we attempted to introduce some kind of central estimates of kind of the physical risk of, of climate change. And these are, these are summarized here in, in this table. And what, what's going on here is we are really quite limited kind of in terms of capacity um, and also timing to kind of results that are all already published, right? So we really kind of, what we did is we combed the literature kind of looking for, for published estimates of, of um, macroeconomic effects, so GDP effects specifically um, to the US uh, or North America um, that were published in the peer reviewed literature. And this table here is kind of outlining, you know, the set of, of types of damages that are out there. These are by no means comprehensive and it's really important to bear that in mind. Uh, in thinking, uh, in kind of interpreting these, these findings. And so what exactly does this look like? Well, we can comb the literature here um, and develop these, you know, pulled out these damage functions from these, these published studies um, and, and essentially aggregated them into a single average uh, a damage function. That's that black line uh, that you see there. Um, and you, you, these, these studies come from a, a number of different approaches. So we've kind of aggregated them into, you, you can see these categorized into kind of CGE style models, a kind of bottom up enumerative kind of sector by sector model, um, as well as these top down econometric uh, studies that are really kind of looking at um, just aggregated relationships between temperature and growth rates. Um, you can see these top down econometric studies tend to kind of give wider error bars. So they, they, they have these bigger, bigger numbers and these kind of uh, kind of concentrated uh, grouping of these other types of studies um, at, you know, kind of uh, in the in the center here. We did look at like other types of weighting across these studies. Uh, we, we are reporting those in the white paper too, and, and that doesn't make a ton of difference. Um, so we aggregate these up uh, into, a, into a single damage function and combined with three global temperature scenarios. So we're looking at, at um, alternate, you know, future pathways of global emissions. Um, we that that gives us altered GDP trajectories, and then as John, you know, because the outcome here that we're interested in here are these kind of fiscal uh, planning measures that then needs to be passed to the OMB budget model in order to look at how the fiscal trajectory looks different under these different uh, trajectories of future GDP, and that is a climate risk alternative that was presented in uh, the the most recent uh, president's budget. Thinking forward, that, so the white paper outlines uh, also outlines kind of a more broader kind of set of questions and agenda around how could we incorporate tr both transition and climate risks uh, into the frame into the macroeconomic forecasting framework. Uh, and in doing this, what we what we tried to do was to kind of think about these, these two literatures, one in the kind of energy systems um, and climate policy space, and one in the kind of climate damages and impact space that were really like, you know, the, the, the goal of, of that work have, has not been to inform macroeconomic forecasting. Um, and so, you know, it, it's a very rich literature. And what we're doing here is we're trying to kind of take some of that and kind of wrestle it into the framework that macroeconomic uh, tools are used to dealing with, right? And so here we're really thinking about, you know, these factors of production, so capital and labor, productivity. And then because we're talking about the energy system here, you know, energy is really important to think about uh, on its own terms as well. And I'm, you know, so, so we think about these, these broad categories of, you know, important macroeconomic variables. And then we also thinking about specific pathways by which the energy system or uh, physical climate change could affect those macroeconomic uh, outcomes. 
Um, and those are what you see in that middle panel there. By no, again, by no means uh, comprehensive. Um, and then we kind of roughly characterize our ability to quantify them. And I should note that if we have any capacity to quantify uh, these effects, it is you know, due to our, our collaboration with a really excellent um, technical expertise at the agencies. Um, uh, most, in, most significantly, uh, we've been working closely with um, DOE and uh, Pacific Northwest National Labs uh, on the trend transition risk side, and EPA, kind of the National Center for Environmental Economics and the Climate Change Division um, on the physical risk side. Um, and so, you know, we, you know, there's a lot uh, of work that has gone into thinking about energy system changes uh, that will come about from climate policy, what the effect on the capital stocks might be. Um, but you can see some important variables, you know, in the supply side decomposition, right, labor is a really important way of thinking about that. Um, and our, you know, our existing models, I would say, you know, have very little to say at the moment about these kind of labor impacts. Um, on, the, on the physical risk side, you know, again, we, you know, there's a concentration of studies in certain aspects, right, so like land and labor productivity, I think we can say, you know, fairly, we have a fairly good confidence what that might look like. Um, but on other areas, I think our capacity is, is much more limited, uh, at least in the near term. So what might it look like to kind of think about, you know, incorporating climate kind of more fully into the, the overall economic assumptions? And this is a kind of one, one track that we are kind of currently exploring um, in the interagency working group and that this, this framework is kind of laid out in the white paper. So as John mentioned, you know, this is, um, you know, what we're looking at here is the 10 year kind of economic assumptions, where here, at least for, at the starting point, we're looking at kind of the, like using the mouth framework to understand how these variables might, uh, uh, you know, integrate up into the macro economy, as well as the longer term economic assumptions where we have this kind of assumption about a kind of future gro uh, balanced growth path. Those then give rise to a kind of set of variables that might conceivably be linked to kind of upstream uh, uh, information on, on climate risks. Um, you know, because of the simplifying assumption in the long run economic assumptions about a balanced growth path, right, the number of variables that we can plug into there are fairly limited. Uh, in, in the, you know, coming out of the mouse model, we've identified a number of variables uh, related to the energy system, some key supply side variables, um, import, you know, capital effects. Um, the we could put, potentially connect to pre-existing, uh, you know, cli uh, climate and energy system models. And so, you know, the ultimate framework could, could well look something like this, where you have to start with a, a kind of comprehensive kind of climate transition scenario that is going to then drive the whole analysis, right? That has to say something about U.S. emissions, but also global climate policy. If we want to say something about, you know, um, the physical risks that, you know, depend a lot on what other countries do. Um, and those ultimately kind of, you know, we need some like question mark here about a model that is able to take those uh, and, and to kind of put out variables that are then comprehensible to this macroeconomic forecasting framework. Uh, potentially those could be the same model um, that, you know, we could think of a kind of comprehensive uh, um, modeling, uh, modeling framework able to think about both physical and transition risks, um, but not necessarily, I think. And then the white paper, we outline a kind of set of options uh, of, of, you know, pros, the kind of desired, you know, characteristics of these uh, models, as well as some potential platforms. Doing this work, we've identified a kind of number of challenges. I think it's worth to talk about um, in brief. Um, you know, like I think the this macroeconometric uh, structure of the mouse model um, is raising challenges, and in particular because it is identified off of these historical relationship, particularly around energy production. Um, what you're seeing is like difficulties when you're trying to impose large changes um, in the structure of the energy system um, onto an economy that is parameterized kind of based on you know the importance of say oil imports and oil exports for like. You you know, net investment uh, is likely to change, right, as we get build out, uh, as we get growing adoption of electric cars. Um, and that is something that, that kind of without a structural model of the energy system, you're going to struggle to represent. Um, it is a U.S. only model. We know there are kind of important international spillovers um, in energy, capital, clean energy, technology markets. Um, missing quantification of climate damages. I kind of always have to emphasize that. Um, the uh, available 
uh, this came up, I think, um, in Jim's talk too, that the, you know, we are interested in this fairly short term kind of like 10 year framework um, where we're not necessarily comfortable saying that we're in an equilibrium, right? And a lot of the available tools are kind of around shifts in equilibria. And if what we're interested in are the dynamics and these kind of shorter term um, responses, um, a lot of, you know, that, that, that would lead us to kind of a different sets of models. Um, limited variables to include in the long-term projections. Um, and then this has come up before, but the difficulty addressing or representing risks and uncertainty when we're really kind of required to produce a single kind of package of economic assumptions, uh, which is what is then gonna go to agencies for budgeting and so on. Um, so with that, uh, links to the, all the white papers and everything if you'd like to follow up um, and we will finish it there. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thanks very much. That's a really interesting observation about sort of the, the how deeply embedded the fossil fuel industry, uh, fossil fuel um, relationships might be inside existing models. Um, okay, Bob Arnold from CBO. Thanks, Jim. Um, let me point out that a lot of what I'm gonna say is gonna cover ground that has already been trod. <laughs> uh, Jim did a masterful job of laying out the landscape uh, in his keynote uh, address. And you're going to see many, many similarities between the processes that we follow at CBO and the processes that were described by John and Fran uh, in their efforts uh, down Pennsylvania Avenue for, for the administration. Um, so first things first, CBO's job is to support the Congress. We are an agency of Congress. Uh, we provide Congress with budget and economic information. Full stop. <laughs> uh, one key aspect is that we have a nonpartisan mandate. So we make no recommendations about policy and we take the nonpartisan uh, mandate quite seriously in the, in the halls of CBO. Um, so what I'm gonna do right now is talk about how, uh, uh, you know, we do our, we do our work uh, creating an economic baseline and how uh, provide some, some channels uh, where climate change can enter into those models. And again, apologies in advance because they're gonna look very similar to what you just, uh, what you just heard from John and, and Fran. Um, so first things first, um, we produce a forecast two times per year. I have to be careful, that's in a normal year. We haven't had a normal year since uh, 2020. Uh, so we've, uh, when the pandemic hit, we produced a, a rapid sequence of, of forecasts. But in a, in a typical year before, uh, uh, before things got disrupted by the pandemic, we would do it twice per year. We would produce an outlook in January and an update to that in, uh, in August. In addition, we have a long-term budget outlook that typically comes out in the summer. That's a 30 year view of the economy. And then we do analysis of social security, which uh, extends typically 75 years. Um, the, key, the key to our work in the division that I work in that produces the, uh, the economic forecast is to basically do two things, provide economic information to Congress, but more importantly, to provide an input to budget projections. Um, so, uh, a lot of what you heard from Fran and John talked about the Troika, three different agencies that combine to produce the budget projections for the administration. Well, we do much the same thing, but with divisions within CBO. So we have a budget division that produces economic uh, budget projections based on our economics. We have a tax division that produces projections of tax revenue based on our economics. So we need to be useful, we meaning the folks doing the economic forecast need to be useful for those budget projections. And what that means is that determines which, determines the structure of the model, but more importantly, determines the variables that we output. Uh, again, uh, the administration does about 50. I thought it was more, I'm, I'm surprised it wasn't a bigger number than that. It seems like it's, uh, it's more, but we provide those variables to our budget tax and other divisions around uh, CBO and they produce those uh, uh, produce those budget projections. So it determines the, you know, the, the variables of, of interest, you know, the, the, the ones you would expect, you know, GDP, interest rates, unemployment, employment. But in addition, there's a special emphasis on incomes uh, compared to private sector forecaster, forecasters. We, we typically put a lot more emphasis on incomes the, the, than they do. Um, it has certain characteristics, the most important of which is it is a current law forecast. So we take the laws that are on the books, there's exceptions to this, but they're too boring to go into right now. But generally speaking, we take the laws that are on the books and we assume that they go forward. 
essentially throughout the forecast horizon, whether it's 10 years or, or 30 years. And this becomes important sometimes because it puts us out of step with private sector forecasters who typically will assume, you know, think of something like the, the debt crisis, the debt ceiling crisis. Uh, typically, private sector forecasters uh, would assume something about what would be done about that. Fortunately, we didn't have to produce a forecast <laughs> before the crisis was resolved, uh, but it might have led to a difference between us and outside forecasters. Um, and so uh, I'll, we have an iterative process, again, very similar to OMB. There's internal review, there's uh, external review, uh, but I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, uh, skip over that and talk about the models that we use. And so what I'm going to do is give, uh, give a, a broad overview and just try to find a couple of uh, points of entry uh, for climate in, into the model. Um, so we have a, a schematic, just as, uh, just as John and, uh, and Fran did, it, very, very similar to, uh, to the way they think of things. Um, as Jim said, there's no one model out there of the economy that everyone uses. Uh, this model is bespoke. It was, uh, it's actually a, a set of models. Uh, it was built and has been developed at CBO. Uh, the most important aspect of this model is that it enforces the variables to add up uh, to, for example, the NIPAs, right? So there's a bunch of stochastic equations that say behavioral equations hiding in there, uh, but there are also a whole bunch of identities, which is to say equations that are true, no matter what values the right-hand side variables take, right? So GDP is always gonna equal consumption, investment, government, and net exports, whether you know consumption is high or low, it's always gonna equal that, that's an identity. So we need to make sure that we enforce internal consistency. And so those identities are crucial for that, uh, for that purpose. Um, so the model is uh, the, ma the macro model in the center of the chart is, uh, uh, is the, you know, the, the centerpiece. Uh, and it is basically a, a collection of both behavioral and, and, and uh, uh, identities. Um, an example of a behavioral uh, equation would be the one for consumer spending, for example. What it's trying to do is mathematically express a relationship that presumably holds over history, right? So in our model, consumer spending, and this is just an example, one of many, many behavioral relationships relationships in the model. Consumer spending is a function of disposable income, wealth, uh, permanent income, some other, other variables involved. And what we use, what we do is use data to estimate what those relationships are, right? If disposable income go, goes up by a dollar, we'd expect consumption, consumer spending to go up by uh, 60 cents or, or, or so. Um, and so similar to what uh, uh, John said, we have uh, a bunch of inputs to this model. They're on the far left-hand side of the screen. Um, these are referred to as exogenous variables, which means that they have limited feedback from other economic outcomes, think GDP, unemployment, interest rates, uh, into the paths for those variables. Population is a, is a good example of that. We also have energy prices, uh, uh, you know, foreign growth uh, is, is an exogenous variable in our model. Uh, in addition, there's some policy variables, some elasticities, some tax rates that we uh, bring in um, uh, from, from outside of the, uh, the, the division. Um, and so what, what we do then is, uh, there's also a, a labor force participation rate model that's sitting off to the side, and we also have a growth model uh, sitting off to the side. I'm gonna have quite a bit more to say about that growth model, because that determines what uh, outcomes are going to be in the, uh, in the longer term, which is what's, uh, what's of most interest to this, to, to this in, uh, group. Um, so uh, you know, the process is we, we you know, feed the inputs into the model, run the model, get an output, review it, rinse and repeat. Uh, so we'll do that over and over again. And whether the review is just within uh, our division, within the forecast group, or whether it's external, um, uh, that'll happen at different points in the process. Um, so the, the key, you know, um, in the uh, element or the key uh, feature of this model is the interaction of aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Um, so there's a demand side of the economy and there's a supply side of the economy. We, we model both and the interaction determines outcomes for other variables in the model. Um, so think of aggregate demand as how much consumers and businesses and government and, um, you know, foreign and uh, domestic uh, folk want to spend at a given constellation of prices. Um, think of aggregate supply as the amount that businesses want to supply, again, at that same constellation of prices. Um, we have a model of potential output. And when I say potential output, think supply side, think this is the, uh, the measure of aggregate supply in the economy. If anyone's interested in, in, in the 
a, a, a more detailed definition. I'll be more than happy to go into that. Uh, but the point is, and again, I'm going to say more about this later, is that that growth model that determines potential output looks at supply side factors. These are the things that matter in the long run, like labor supply, like the capital stock, and like the productivity of labor and capital. Those are the crucial variables that enter into the estimate of potential and in the projection of potential. Um, and so uh, another key distinction in this model is between the very near term and then what we call the medium term uh, and then the longer term, right? So the near term is the period where we care a lot about business cycle fluctuations, all right? So the next two to five years, depending on the state of the business cycle. Um, and our, our fundamental assumption or our, the fundamental characteristic of the model is that in the short run, most economic outcomes, and when I say economic outcomes, think GDP, unemployment, employment, so on and so forth, are determined by fluctuations in aggregate demand. I think the reason for that is pretty simple. Supply moves slowly in the short run. It's hard to adjust the number of factories you're using to produce Teslas or whatever uh, in, in the short run. So in the short run, it's mostly demand side fluctuations. Um, and however, once you get beyond the short run in the medium term and the long run, then supply takes over. And in, indeed, one of the assumptions of our approach is that once you get past the short run, all of the movements in real GDP are determined by movements in potential GDP, right? We know there's gonna be business cycles out there. We just make no effort to try to forecast them uh, because that would be too difficult to do. And you know, in, in, in all like, essentially we're assuming that they're going to average out towards the, uh, the long run potential for the economy. Um, so, um, I've managed to avoid talking about climate change to this point. Uh, let me just uh, let me just uh, uh, talk about a couple of uh, windows or a couple of uh, uh, portals where it can enter into this uh, into this framework. So, in the short run, and several of these have been touched on already. Um, in the short run, you can think of the traditional analysis of fiscal policy, right? So, you know, think about uh, the IRA, for example, right? It had spending associated with it. We're very accustomed to calculating the economic effects of changes in fiscal policy of that nature, right? And uh, as uh, Jim pointed out, uh, it does have effects on economic activity in the near term if the government decides it's going to spend more money. Uh, whether it displaces something more productive is a different question that we can, uh, we can, we can talk about later. Uh, so that's number one. Um, infrastructure obviously as another example within CBO we have an estimate of what the rate of return on infrastructure is so in addition to the direct effect of the spending we've got an estimate of the effect on productivity of the uh, infrastructure changes um, those are fairly straightforward the harder ones in the near term are some of the things that were brought up in the questions uh, on Jim's keynote speech uh, which is you know what is the effect of, of risk <laughs> on the cost of capital uh, that could enter uh, and as Wendy pointed out that if it's in the historical data then it will naturally be reflected in our projections but we don't make any we don't add anything to our models or our method to to reflect that ditto same for productivity. If it's reflected in the data, it will be in our estimate. But we, 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 with one exception, we do make a, a, a which I'll get to in a second. We do, uh, we do make an uh, an estimate that affects productivity. Okay, so that's the the channels in in the short run, and you can see there's you know the budget projections are on the right hand side. That's the output of of CBO. Be aware that they feedback around, there should be one more line from that, that far, uh, far right box to the exogenous variables because the budget inputs, uh, budget projections become an input in subsequent iterations for our model. Um, okay, so um, let's talk, uh, talk more about climate. Um, we get asked all the time by members of Congress uh, what the, you know, whether our projections reflect uh, the effects of climate change. Uh, the, an the answer is yes, but <laughs> only a little. Um, and let me just echo, uh, my clicker seems to be dead. Uh-oh, now I've done it. <laughs> All right, I'm not even gonna try. Um, so there we go, thank you. Uh, the deus ex machina took care of it. Um, so uh, let me just echo something that Jim said, uh, Jim said earlier. Um, Models are tools. Uh, there's no good models or bad models. And again, there's no unified model of the economy that we can turn to. Um, there's only models that are useful 
for the task at hand or models that are not useful for the, uh, the task at hand. Uh, in our view, the model that I just described is useful for producing economic outcomes that feed into budget projections. Um, it's also useful to explain what's going on in the economy, in my view. Uh, it is not well suited for estimating the effects of climate change on the model. So we are not producers, and I, when I say we, I mean not just my group, but also CBO, uh, with a little bit with a little bit of a caveat in there. Um, we're we're consumers uh, of of climate effects on, on the economy, as opposed to producers. Um, I would argue that our model is fairly well suited for uh, taking an outside estimate of what the effect of climate is on the macro economy, and then tracing through the effects to you know, the, all the variables that are relevant for the, uh, for the budget and, and, and for the economy. Um, so fortunately, such an outside estimate is available. Uh, it's not done in my division, which is the macroeconomic division, uh, but we have a separate division at CBO called the micro studies division. Uh, and uh, they've been, they spend a lot of time thinking about climate change, uh, and they've come up with an estimate of uh, a delta uh, uh, to GDP growth uh, that is expected uh, from the effects of climate change in the next uh, 30 plus years. Um, and essentially, well, not essentially, I'll give you the estimate. The estimate is that in 2050, uh, the level of real GDP will be about a percentage point lower than it would be uh, had climate conditions of the late 20th century uh, continued uh, through that period. Um, so when we're doing our forecast, we layer that delta on top of our estimate of total factor productivity. Uh, and that, again, feeds through the, to the model, obviously affects real GDP, uh, but then it feeds through to the incomes that uh, uh, are used to calculate uh, tax revenues and, and other variables in the model. Um, so. Uh, the, the method that, uh, that the micro uh, studies division uh, used to uh, calculate delta is up on the schematic. Uh, you will learn quickly that I will exhaust my knowledge of their method very, very quickly, uh, but essentially it consists of two parts. Uh, there's an estimate that's based on the GDP effects of changes in temperature and precipitation. I believe that's the dark brown uh, uh, sector up at the top left of the, uh, uh, of the schematic. Um, and that's based on a view of recent outside research. Uh, and it is distilled, condensed, and turned into a, a single estimate. <clears throat> Um, and then there's an estimate of the effect on GDP resulting from hurricane damage, uh, which I believe was pre-existing, uh, but then they, uh, the folks in micro studies uh, fed it through a macro model to uh, uh, translate those effects into an effect on GDP. Uh, so again, uh, we've just exhausted my knowledge of that process, uh, but fortunately we have one of the authors, uh, well, there is a working paper on uh, CBO's website, and one of the authors of that paper is online. So if there are any questions about this uh, method or this procedure, I will quickly, quickly shift them to Evan Hernstadt, uh, who I believe is online, and will uh, we'll be able to handle them uh, with, uh, with ease. Um, so with that, um, I'm looking forward to answering questions, and I will leave it there. Thanks. Thanks, that was great. So um, put your questions uh, in the online chat feature, but I'm just gonna start um, with a super quick one. Fran, the reveal here, uh, um, could you, so for those of us who haven't um, perfectly committed to memory, the CBO OMB report, can you give us your 2050 decrement? Uh, so, he's, uh, so Bob just said 1%. That is easy. That is a good question. Um, our main outcome, the one that is presented in the uh, LTBO is um, debt to GDP ratios. So you're not kind of fully, you know, those, you can't kind of fully recover the, the GDP effect from those, but you can, you can look at, which I'm doing now, um, the damage functions that we show in, uh, in the white paper and you know, there is a range. We are showing alternate uh, temperature trajectories under three different, um, but I would say it's the magnitude, I, I'm pretty sure is broadly consistent with CBO. It possibly slightly less because they are also incorporating these um, hurricane uh, damages as well. Great, okay, thanks very much. Um, but of course, I mean, just to be clear, this is focusing on, you know, the first first round of, you know, fairly straightforward things and there's other things to, 
that's the sort of the point here is to think about what those other things might be. So thank you. Okay, so we have um, uh, Galena Hale. Yes, thank you. Uh, so when I think about the GDP forecast, mostly what I hear and see in the literature is the damages from actual climate events plus uh, losses from adaptation spending, as Jim pointed out, this is investment in the non-productive uh, activities or capital. Uh, but what I don't usually hear is productivity from the new industries that arise as we attack climate change problems. So investment in alternative energy, alternative proteins, direct carbon capture, to the extent that new industries tend to grow faster than the old industries, wouldn't that be potentially a boost to GDP growth? And how do we, is there anything in the models that you're working with that could potentially incorporate that? Is that already incorporating uh, this kind of effects that could be actual productive investment as part of the transition to uh, a sustainable economy? Thanks. Yeah, um, so, the way we're thinking about the energy transition effects, and it is, you're, you're a hundred percent right that getting getting this kind of um, this this kind of shifting investment and the the aggregate effects of that is kind of really I think the focus of a lot of that work. Um, I would say you know we we are looking at you know invest you know you you have this combined effect right like you're you're kind of investing in these new technologies you are um kind of decreasing investments or maybe kind of prem even prematurely retiring kind of assets in uh polluting industries um you know it, it, i think so the models at least captured like i would say the first order effect of that um the, the second order question that, that you alluded to is like if there's something going on with these new industries maybe there are network effects kind of kind of tipping style dynamic that i i think uh i'm i can if anyone's online from gcam they can correct me but um i think are maybe pretty imperfectly represented right now i'll just uh add on to that um that uh, there's always talk of structural change in the economy, and I'll just point out, there is always structural change in the economy, right? The economy is adapting every single year, every single decade, every single century. Uh, and it's always amazing to me when we look at the long historical sweep of data, uh, how remarkably stable the productivity growth rate is when you look at that data. I mean, it moves, no, you know, make no mistake about it, you know, late 90s, it surged, you know, et cetera. But it's remarkable to me when you go back to the 1800s, how, how, how stable it is. So I just, my only point is that that is always a feature of the economy. Um, I don't think our models are uh, set up to capture, you know, energy rising or falling and green energy rising or falling. That, that you know, that's just not what they're designed to do. Uh, but structural change is always a feature of, uh, of the macro economy. Okay. Uh the, I just want to say that the, the um, GDP, uh, welfare, et cetera, effects of um, capital stock effects of carbon capture are really an interesting thing to think through. So I'm just going to pose that out there as a puzzle. And the way to pose the puzzle is suppose that we decided we kind of got the, 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 the point in the periodic table wrong and somebody went off and passed a bill for nitrogen capture. How would that affect, you know, what would the economics of that and the welfare effects of that be? So it's kind of an interesting, it's an interesting set of thought experiments in terms of your economic modeling. Okay, so we can got... I can I um just do an asterisk on based on Bob's uh, comments? Yeah, yeah, please. Um I would say like I think structural change is always a part of the economy. I will say like energy is a very important part of like the macro economy and the macroeconomic forecast. If you just look at like the role it plays in kind of inflation and in inflation expectations, right? You know, and a lot of like that are like our economic relationship with energy, I think is like kind of embedded in some aspects of that macroeconomic forecast. And to the extent we are particularly changing the energy system, I think it is possible, you know, it's important to think about how that might be particular to this case uh, as opposed to kind of more general like structural transformations. Okay, I'm having some difficulty reading this. I think it's Steve Braun. So my question follows partially from Galena's question, partially from Jim Stock's earlier question about the elevated roadway. Uh, no, I mean, the, the elevated roadway actually in the year that you were building the elevated roadway, you'd be increasing, 
this aspect of climate change would increase GDP. And in that case, it wouldn't add any to the capital stock in the long run. So the effect would be negative in the sense that you were stealing capital from some other more productive use. But let's suppose that um, uh, John Jones uh, invents a machine that sucks carbon out of the atmosphere and that the, every, the, every government in the world uses John Jones's machine to suck carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, and that's something that we've never valued before. But you could see that 30 years from now, we're going to value that a lot. Then we'd be actually be increasing GDP uh, because we're now spending money on something we never valued before. Uh, and there would uh, and then there would be a lot of investment and investment counts twice in GDP. It counts once when you buy the investment and the second time as that investment good depreciates. So if we stop consumption and we um, uh, spend a lot more money on these kinds of investments, we could actually be increasing GDP from the effect of climate change. Now, what's clear is that this would not increase welfare, okay? But we could be increasing GDP. So, uh, you know, all students of, of uh, national income accounts know that GDP is not the same as welfare. Uh, and so I think we, uh, as we go along, we just, we have to keep this in mind that there's, uh, uh, and, and I, somehow up to this point, the focus has always been on GDP, but I think um, consumption is a better measure of welfare, and maybe we should um, keep track of that, and that's uh, all I want to say. Yeah, <laughs> agreed. <laughs> and just to provide another example, you know, uh, it, <laughs> the, the irony of you know, hurricane damage, right? When a hurricane hits South Florida, uh, the irony is that economic activity actually increases in, in, well, not in the very short run in that local area, but then, you know, when you rebuild, it actually boosts GDP. Uh, so that's uh, an example similar to Jim's uh, elevated roadway. Subject to having the capacity to actually do that. So it might be different in other countries as there's been research documenting. Um, okay, uh, oh. I don't see, this is really frustrating. Oh, uh, so Hunter L.M. Hi, it's Lori Hunter. Thank you, everybody. I'm sorry to not be there. Um, I think this is a question for Evan because it was punted, right, for the micro, <laughs> micro models. I'm curious about the micro model where you, the very first um, section was where you take weather output relationships from economic, uh, econometric models, I presume in the literature, integrate them with climate change scenarios. I'm wondering, can you give some examples of the kinds of relationships that are represented in that box about uh, that's pulling from the literature? And do you have any concerns about key gaps um, within that particular piece of the model? Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so these are all studies that relate um, aggregate output to shocks in temperature and precipitation. So they're not individual mechanisms. Um, so for example, you know, you think about like some of Marshall Burke's work, some of um, Saul Shung's work, um, like these econometric studies that I think Fran highlighted in her uh, review, which was a little more comprehensive in that it brought in CGE models and um, some of these enumerative studies. So in terms of gaps, yeah, absolutely. We talk about, you know, things that are uncertain or missing um, in our working paper. And, you know, I think someone brought up, uh, maybe it was John, that, you know, we're talking about U.S. specific models on the, like, macro modeling side. But that's a problem here, too, right? So, like, we're not capturing, you know, things like trade spillovers, we're not capturing migration, um, things that would happen sort of in a broader like global equilibrium. Um, and so, you know, those are things that are obviously super useful for anyone who's listening that is doing academic research on this stuff. Um, yeah. Great, Thanks, James Sarah. Rising. Wonderful. <clears throat> I, uh, I think it's really interesting that, that sort of both on the OMB side and on the 
um, uh, the CBA side, uh, that there's this um, uh, solution, which is to really impose these kind of constraints on the inputs. And it's exactly, I think, where we need targeted models to understand the endogeneities that come out of um, climate uh, damages and transition risks and those costs that, that come out of those and the rest of the economic uh, system. And so I'd really uh, like to better understand sort of what the opportunities are for shifting that from the input side into the cores of these models. Yes, an excellent question. So you can, I think I, we have two questions. Oh, sorry. Here. So no, no, go ahead, but I mean, we have a couple of things. Oh, yeah. sorry, right. We have these two questions. Oh, I guess actually uh, Evan answered, uh, yeah, hunters. So that's fine. Yes, we have this one. Um, I think, so, so you're right. So the endogeneity is a concern and we have, right now we have this kind of chain of, chain of modeling, right? We we're kind of connecting one to another um, example. I think important examples are things like energy demand, right? So, you know, GCAM kind of takes energy demand as a given and then it kind of meets that energy demand in a kind of least cost way under kind of certain constraints on the energy system. Um, you know, like if we're, you know, energy prices are changing, energy demand is not is not exogenous and like and it's potentially quite important. Um, and so we would definitely, you know, we appreciate kind of the value of like a kind of more whole economy modeling of the kind, you know, the kinds that are done um, often in kind of CGE style frameworks. Um, and, you know, the 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 downside of that is then you are in an equilibrium framework and you're, you're not capturing um, the dynamics and the dynamics are part of the, the goal here. And thinking uh, exactly how to marry those two things together is um, where we are kind of still still working. Um, if, I, if I could just add one other consideration um, in response to, to James' question, you know, I, I think ultimately we also have to go back to the constraint of what, what is the question we're trying to answer, right? And so we are working under the constraint currently of, of fitting this into the, the president's budget and doing budget forecasting. And that, that requires, you know, certain aspects of a model to, to exist in the framework. And so that is a constraint in the ways we can endogenize other macroeconomic impacts, right? So we're, you know, we're certainly, as Fran said, thinking through this and it's top of mind, but but there are additional constraints when it comes to thinking about macroeconomics. Um, thanks, Christopher Barris. Hi, thanks very much. Um, it was uh, interesting among the various uncertainties that we faced, one that I didn't see mentioned was the um, available supply of critical minerals which I think needs to be incorporated in your list of climate to macro factors. And you know, in particular, as, as economists, we know that quantity supplied is gonna equal quantity demanded. So we tend to ignore that problem, but there is a physical limit here that needs to be considered. And, and so that would just be one thing that I would, I would add. And uh, also just related to the last question on um, in the endogeneity, I think it, the other thing that I didn't see mentioned, but was in the presentation, uh, was an energy efficiency parameter. That is the, the relationship between output and energy inputs. And that's something that's, you know, is going to be a function of the price of energy, but it's technology dependent and it's almost unforecastable. So that's another big source of uncertainty, but I think one that needs to be at least called out as a separate assumption that's calibrated um, as, you know, in, in the production functions that we'll be using in the future. And then just to reinforce Steve's point, I think it's not even as as bad as it's it's worse than he says because to the extent that you have governments uh, who are not sensitive to the price of capital, uh, doing infrastructure investment and remediation to deal with climate, you're sucking resources out of the economy that then reduces consumption even more. So. So on the, on the energy efficiency point, uh, definitely well taken. And um, I, I would say we do have some forecasts. So particularly on the, um, the, the, the if we're thinking about 
particular technologies being a kind of focus of, you know, this, this energy, this change in the energy system, um, you know, I think we know heat pumps and electric vehicles kind of are more e are more efficient. And like that is, that is something that can be captured in the current modeling in, in GCAM. Um, I think, well, can you remind me of the first question? The uh, commodity supplies is a physical limit. To yes, the transition. yeah, I, I, I agree. I think you know, and that that is a problem. You know, we are in a kind of U.S. focused kind of U.S. modeling framework, and when you're thinking about global supply um, constraints that are operating in an environment where many countries are trying to do this transition at the same time, um, that is kind of not something we're able to capture. I'll just jump in. This is almost harkening back to Jim's keynote, uh, as well as your question, Chris. Um, we we think hard about uncertainty in our projections. We're asked often about the uncertainty inherent in our projections. And if you look at our reports, you'll see uh, various error bands uh, calculated in various different ways. Uh, you know, the, we do the best we can, um, more so at the 10-year window than, uh, than further out. But ultimately, when you're talking about budget projections, when you're talking about answering questions for Congress, they want a number, <laughs> or really a, a path, not one number, but a, a path of numbers. They, you know, scenarios are, are useful for helping see different outcomes. But ultimately, when you're doing budget projections, you're going to be asked for asked for a single number. So we uh, we try very hard to convey the uncertainty, but ultimately, it goes back to the baseline. Bob Cop. Uh, so, so a couple of questions, one following up on that, one of my questions was, well, should that requirement for a single scenario be revisited um, in light of sort of expectation that we're going to see increasing uncertainty? Um, but I'll, I'll sort of reframe that as, well, okay, if you're focusing on the baseline, the natural question to know is how good is the baseline? So how do you think about retrospective analyses? And uh, is that, are these baseline scenarios we're focusing on actually have any record of historical performance compared to other scenarios. And then my, my, my second question, um, how do, uh, how, how do you, you all think about shocks in your model? So I saw on France diagram sort of physical risk flood, flood, uh, fed into long run equilibrium, but not into the, the 10 year time frame. Uh, okay. It wasn't drawn in there, but, but basically if you think about extreme, you know, large enough extreme event uh, to have an effect on the 10 year time frame. How do you, you know, I guess I've probably just goes into a scenario, but, but do you even think about those scenarios? And obviously the most extreme example of that would be thinking, okay, well, 2019, how do you think about a uh, risk of a pandemic and how that might affect your short-term forecast? So on, on the first question, uh, in addition to thinking about uncertainty a lot, we think about forecast accuracy a lot too, as you might imagine. And we do a regular report routinely every two years that does a look back and compares our uh, projections. We do this not just for the economics, but also for the budget projections, tax and spending, uh, and uh, essentially uh, compare ourselves to uh, other, other forecasters and see how we, how we did. Um, spoiler alert, no one's good at this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, we're doing about as well as the other forecasters are. Um, uh, the second question was uh, about shocks. Obviously, we think about shocks. Um, shocks, almost by definition, are unforecastable. <laughs> so uh, you try to get the risk in as best you can. Um, and so we will often um, try to... Uh, I'm not thinking about climate so much as recessions. So we will try to get the possibility of recession in some of our projections. Uh, so we might shade our, our, our forecast in one direction or another. Uh, that's an example that came off the top of my head. There, there, you know, there are probably others. Um, when people bring up the a chance of a shock, we might shade our, our, our forecast to reflect the possibility. Yes, um, so we are definitely thinking about the physical risk on the on the ten year time frame as well. I think uh, kind of would echo kind of what Bob said. You know that like this is not um, you know like if if it's not forecastable, like you're kind of not necessarily going to put it in, but you want to have maybe the expectation value. I you know like you know historically, and this came up in we had some conversations with kind of blue chip forecasters about kind of doing some of this work, and 
you know, the, the question of exactly how big does a, say, a, a major extreme event have to be before it, for it to show up in kind of aggregate um, GDP numbers. And it, it's really like we're talking very, very major events. And so I think Katrina is the example where you really saw a kind of measurable effect in aggregate US GDP. And a lot of that was coming, my understanding is kind of coming through kind of um, oil kind of energy system impact. Um, and, you know, like, you know, thinking kind of going forward like you know how might that change or kind of what might be these pathways that do aggregate up into these into these larger effects i, I think would be a, a good place to kind of focus more attention okay thanks very much so that actually brings us to a close of this session bridget do you have a few uh words for us yeah, I just want to say, first of all, great presentations, I think very informative. Um, and I just wanted to note that we are moving into, we're doing a little bit of a, um, just to gather more information from our workshop participants, we've opened a Slido tab um, where uh, there should be a link coming into the chat where you can access it. Um, but this is just a way that we can get more of your thoughts, insights, or, and or additional questions regarding this session's topic. So um, you can access the, the Slido platform either by scanning the QR code or clicking on the link. Um, and we encourage our in-person participants to kind of turn to your neighbor and talk to each other um, and just kind of co-generate some of these ideas. And then you can just insert them into that platform platform. Um, and similarly, for our virtual participants, we'll open some, some breakout rooms that you can kind of informally go into and just chat with um, other virtual participants. Um, and then we'll close those